Hi, and welcome to Bright Talk, coming to you live from Big Data London at London Olympia. I'm Tim Carmichael from Ensafera, and I'm joined today by three distinguished speakers on data and analytics, and they are Raghu Ramakrishnan, the Chief Technology Officer for Data from Microsoft, Pete Hannum, the data, Head of Data and Engineering from 6.6, and Tom Mack, Vice President EMEA from Cubol. Gentlemen, you're all very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Today, the purpose of our panel is to talk about self-service and democratization of data. Uh, and we'd like to do a bit of a deep dive in this, leaning on your experience and your understanding. So thank you for joining us. So I'm going to start with the first question. And Tom, I'd like to bring that to you and start the conversation that way. Let's start with the basics. Why self-serve? What are the advantages of this kind of approach for most organizations? Right, I think it's the pace of change within the business right now leans towards and requires uh, the people that can make business decisions based on the data to have that empowered and get the data engineering teams uh, and the infrastructure out of the way to allow people to then to make the proper business decisions based on the timeliness of the actual uh, the data itself. And do you think that, uh, Pete, most people think that this is a good thing for their businesses when you're advising them from 6.6? Totally, I mean, if, if you think about, um, as Tom said, getting technology out of the way, giving people access to data much more easily, much more quickly, and also think about the data itself. We're not having copies of data scattered across the business. We know everyone's working on the same data sets, so therefore people are assuming the same him sheet, et cetera, et cetera. It just really helps the business know that everyone is working with the same data sets and, and giving the same results, essentially, at the end. Raghu, do you think that there's an advantage there to be had by going straight to the users and consumers and demanders of insight with a self-service approach? I don't think we have a choice. Uh, as data becomes more integral to the decision making at company after company, the reality is the number of people, the breadth of people who are relying on that data for a decision is simply growing too rapidly for anything but self-serve. Right. So I think, on the one hand, this is the way we need to go. On the other hand, we do need to make sure that people understand the interpretations they are placing on the data. So I would caution that as self-serve catches on, uh, it's also important for people to become more data literate, statistics literate, right? Uh, let me tell you a story. Way back in the day, when LaTeX became available as a formatting uh, service, someone remarked that all of a sudden it was much harder to tell the bad papers from the good because everything looked so good, right? Self-serve can do that to your data, so you have to be cautious in interpreting it. And that's interesting that you sound a note of caution, even as we're talking about the, uh, the advantages, because clearly there are going to be some potential pitfalls here. Uh, Pete, uh, have you got an idea of the things that you would look out for to advise people when, if they're moving into a self-service approach, what are the potential pitfalls that they need to be aware of and take steps to avoid? I think it goes back to what you were saying about you know, it's, it's quality. So many of these papers are coming out with false statistics where people move, you know, take, take the axes of a graph, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, if you give people data, they can make poor choices off those and they can dig themselves into quite a big hole. So, if people don't understand the way that data can or should be used, if they don't have the correct governance process around that, or if the data just has quality issues, it could be that someone makes quite a big decision of data that came with caveats, but they didn't see those caveats because they were just looking at a spreadsheet. So I think it's important that, that people know where data's come from, they understand the way to use that data and how to enable that data to go forward in the business, as opposed to just going, ooh, data, this is great, I can make some pretty charts out of this, thank you very much. And that does imply a certain amount of data literacy, doesn't it, as Rag has already mentioned. Do you think on that maturity curve, uh, Tom, that uh, the kind of people that your company deals with have the data literacy to do this across the board? Or uh, is it no. still evolving? Uh, definitely. What we recommend is you start small and build off the success. So moving from the data center into products like Azure and services like AWS allows you to then try things out, prove success, and then expand, uh, both from a use case perspective, but also data set perspective. So the cloud has enabled people to then slowly prove success, get good solid results about it, and then expand uh, without making massive commitments up front uh, to a lot of the infrastructure in the data center. So let's say that a, an organization has taking advice and it's thinking, yes, I'm gonna, we're going to go for this self-service approach because, as Raghu said, really they can't afford not to uh, as 
the, the volume and variety and the speed of change of big data comes their way, uh, what can they use? What tools are out there? Casting aside perhaps your own loyalties to your own organizations for a moment, who wants to talk me through uh, the landscape out there of the kind of tools and techniques that people will need to adopt to get to a successful self-service approach? Raghur, can we start with you? Sure. <clears throat> I think it starts with being able to get an inventory of what data you have at your fingertips, right? So that's the broad area of catalogs, right? Uh, everything from traditional relational catalogs to the more emerging, hey, let's sniff various files, various sources of data, and try to extract schema information. Let's try to create collaborative ways of interpreting that data and make it self-documented. Uh, then there's the whole slew of reporting and OLAP-style dashboards, the traditional workhorses. Uh, then I would say there's all the visualization tools, uh, all the tools for doing a mix of exploratory analysis, right? Uh, increasingly, there are tools that begin to segue uh, into actual querying, right? And then, of course, there are hardcore developer backends. So there's a full gamut of tools, and I haven't even gotten into the true backend storage uh, ERP style uh, systems. But purely on the front end, there's quite a spectrum, right? Uh, and one area that's still in its infancy, but I think going to be important, increasingly important, governance. Keeping a sense of who used what weight, uh, data at what time for what purpose. Not only is this good hygiene, increasingly it's required for regulatory purposes. And you're better off governing your data from the get-go than trying to back into it later. So. The challenge with governance is, of course, many people see governance as governance to constrain. It, they have it in a compliance optic, as opposed to good governance, which I would argue is governance to enable. So how do you en enable the kind of governance that allow people the liberty to go query the data and do good with it from a consumer's perspective as a self-service approach? What would, your, what would your advice be? I think the tooling is not quite there, as you're saying, but I think it is definitely getting there around the governance point of view. We're seeing increasing security baked into data products, so you can have field-level permissions such that I know I can play with any data that's in front of me because the, you know, the, the platforms themselves don't let me see data which I'm not, not allowed to see. So that then means I can just go away and play with the data, find my own insights, because I don't have to really worry about it. The governance is transparent, as opposed to, I think, traditionally, you know, if you think about taking a very large access database, no disparage on that, but you know, it's quite a simple security model. So it might be that I just get email with this access database. Can I see this? Should I be allowed to have this? Whereas having a self-serve platform which is centrally managed with centrally applied governance processes, centrally managed security, I can log into it and everything I can then play with just I know is fine. So I don't have to, it's not something I have to think about because central IT is managing this governance process and as a consumer, all I worry about is, okay, do I have a pretty chart? What tool am I using? Do I need to learn Python to get through this? Et cetera. So that takes us to the place where you're clearly describing one of the approaches that liberates the user from having to understand too much, notwithstanding their need for some data literacy. Uh, Tom, what, the, what are the, the techniques and strategies you think a company should adopt when it's, when it's implementing a self-service approach? What are the things to look out for? The first thing we see with our clients is they'll start to try and standardize on the actual collection of the data. Uh, creating SDKs as an example for their applications to start streaming that data and landing it into a data lake, uh, whether that's a cloud data lake or on-premise data lake. So if you get the uh, actual collection right, that makes it much easier to apply things like lineage uh, after the fact, and then watching how that data evolved into that curated data set that is then self-served up to the different constituents out there in the world. So we see it starting there as that kind of initial ingestion and then uh, being able to track how that changed uh, throughout the whole process, whether that's a Spark ETL process or some sort of structured streaming uh, effort uh, to land that data in the data lake. So do you think that there's um, 
uh, an aspect here that talks about, sure, we could land some technology, yes, we can deliver the governance, yes, we can put the tools in place, but you can bring a horse to water, as the phrase goes. Uh, what about the cultural challenges of bringing people to a self-service approach, which is very different from being delivered that report, being delivered that dashboard, and interpreting that? Uh, do you think that there are um, genuine cultural challenges here, or is that just something that people hide behind? I think it's a cycle. <clears throat> so let me give an example. At Microsoft, we've been a very data-driven company. Now I'm speaking internally of our culture of consuming data to make decisions. Not so much our external we sell platforms. Uh, and if you look at our internal data lake, it took several years before the use grew beyond the first two or three core teams that were committed to it. And then there came a knee, right? And I think that had something to do with the viral effect of sharing data. Some teams created something that other teams found useful, then they produced stuff, it, it created the cycle. Once you reach that tipping point, I think people aren't shy, right? There's an ecosystem of others that they can go to for help. Uh, it becomes a point where when you say something, you need to back it up, yeah. and you back it up with data. The real danger then becomes if you don't have a rock solid approach to tracking, securing, governing your data, it becomes very hard, right, to close the barn door after the horses have started stampeding, right? So there's something there about <coughs> At a certain point, the data generates its own momentum. That's right. And the self-service approach generates its own momentum. To take people to that point, is there, there's clearly, for me, uh, as a data leader, a role for leadership here. Uh, when you're advising your clients, uh, um, where, where are you getting to on advising them on leadership and how, that they, how they tackle this problem? Leadership has to be embedded in the company. It's one thing just to say that and dictate to someone, you will use this data and you will share it. If you look at company cultures, typically data has been stored in silos. And so you have you know, the postcode data team who just manage that postcode data. You may have the accounts payable team who just manage that accounts payable team. But as Rugu says, you, know, you get to this point where you have to start sharing data. And I think that from a leadership point of view, you have to start breaking these barriers down. And, and how heavy handed depends on your company culture and, and, and how you wade into that. But I think that if you just wade in and say, you know, no, you will share data with you know, this other team, people will be resistant to that. So as Raghu says, you know, if you start to show people the benefits of sharing, and you basically, you know, you start to show, give a child some candy, and you can, you know, I'm, so I'm training a puppy at the moment. You, get, you, lead, <laughs> you lead a puppy with treats, and you encourage them to explore the world. Whereas if I smack my puppy, she'll shy away from me and she'll get upset. So I, I, I think that really, from a leisure point of view, it, it has to be about show, it has to be about, you know, here are the tools, here is how we think this can work, and here is a pilot study of this somewhere, you know, show the rest of the business how, it can, how you can succeed with this, as opposed to, here is a memo, all of us will now share data, and you must all do this. I, just, I think leadership needs to be gentle. And that talks to your point, doesn't it, Tom, about starting small and yeah. showing people the way. And it's usually driven by a use case as well, There's something specific, uh, either a fundamental change within the business or some specific uh, strategic initiative that is uh, actually happening from within. So, a, a simple example for us was Autodesk was moving from a, shipping a disk for their software to more of a subscription model. That is a fundamental change in how you actually measure the business. How many CDs did I ship versus what's my daily active user for a specific product segment. So a lot of times it has some fundamental you know, corporate strategy that's behind it that will also dictate that change and that pace uh, much faster. Th that's a point I want to really reinforce, Tom. If you think of data as some abstract thing, and you're told, go celebrate it. No one does. Yep. When you start seeing that data as reflecting some aspect of your business that your, your next step hinges on, it's very different. And increasingly, businesses are instrumenting every touch point, right? Whether it's their supply chain, whether it's their customer touch points, whether it's their manufacturing process, whether it's their website, whether it's the telemetry for their you know, infrastructure, it does not matter. It's something you can view through the lens of data. Once you start seeing it that way, once you realize it's putting you in touch with the pulse of your machine, uh, 
then frankly, I'm not worried about this step of getting people to start using data, right? I'm much more concerned about the deluge that comes after. So you'll always have, when you move to a fully data-driven or event-driven architecture or business, you know, you're going to, as you said, deluge of data you can have there, people will be able to generate value from that, but it, it comes with a GDPR and so on. Oh, yeah. What are the impacts of, of these insights? It could be that I, I find out some quite fascinating insights through an abuse of personal data that we shouldn't necessarily know about. And you know, great, we'll have a market lead on that, but actually then the regulatory will come and clamp down on us and we find it's public embarrassing. So it's, it's, it goes back to this, the conversation earlier about governance and strategies and how do we deal with it as opposed to actually just give everyone the data. So do you think that organizations have those appropriate um, mechanisms and frameworks in place to do that right? Or do you think that with self-service comes a risk of uh, constructive anarchy? I think, I think every business has potential for that. But I think, you know, people can get things wrong, they're going to make mistakes. And that goes back to this idea of, a, you know, a nice use case, start small, learn from those mistakes before you suddenly roll out to the whole of your global enterprise and suddenly realize, that, oh, actually we weren't GDPR compliant. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, you, you, you have to make those mistakes yourselves and adapt your culture and adapt the technology because anyone can install Microsoft Access, but you know, how you actually use that in your business workflow and how it sits in your product space is going to be different because every business is different. You know, and that's what we see in the consulting world. I can go there and recommend Hadoop or I can go and recommend Kafka, or, you know, whatever the, the product is, but you need to adapt those products to fit the business requirements rather than saying, oh, well, I have, I have HBase here, therefore I'm going to change the way my business works to sit with HBase. No, it's, it's a collaboration between technology and business. There's definitely collaboration there, and I think as on the boundary of that collaboration is the art of interpreting. Uh, interpreting something so that you understand enough about the place you're going to go and find an answer, but crucially you understand enough about the business area in which you're posing the question. And there is an art and a skill, isn't there, to posing the right business question that takes you to a set of answers that offer you insight and utility. So how do we grow that skill in people who are having to self-serve for the first time, they're faced with a democratized solution, but they're actually not really used to, to posing the right questions? Tom? Right. So the way we do it, uh, we look at our clients and we rate them, to be honest with you, as we're working through as they start looking at the product. Because you're right. You uh, have a league table of your clients. Yeah, we do. Uh, because what we want to be able to do is talk about how they can, we can enable them, but doing it in the most pragmatic way. Because if you look at data science as an example, there is a massive uh, maturity difference across uh, different constituents that have that role. How well you understand the business has a massive effect on how accurate your models uh, could end up being. So it's that combination of solid engineering, solid mathematics, and uh, business understanding, and the three of those coming together and you have the ideal data science candidate. So what we try and do is figure out, okay, uh, based on the profile of these users, where can we start, again, I go back to start small, build on that success, and then come up with a roadmap over time, two, three years, to help them along that path and that journey. And do you think those characteristics you spoke about, about the, the mathematical and statistical approach, uh, and the understanding of the business, are you ever truly going to be vested in an individual, or do you think it's more of a team approach to it to get that? Ooh, uh, I mean, you do, you will have your outliers that can do all three uh, and do those pretty well, but I think it's definitely more of a team approach where you're starting to build out a data science team that's uh, pretty significant. But where we see the most success is actually where the data scientists are in bed with the uh, functional line of business, uh, as opposed to as a central organization. So working directly with the folks that are responsible for uh, the KPIs or OKRs uh, for the business, uh, and then tying that back and being that liaison back to the data engineering team uh, and that kind of cross-function uh, area within the organization. Plus one on that, Tom. Yeah. So it's interesting because uh, we, we've moved into the area of structure there, and I'm always wary when people start talking about structure because some people think, oh, data transformation, let's write a new organizational chart. Now what are we going to do with that? As opposed to what's the problem we're trying to solve. But at some point you have got to figure out, haven't you, where you put your people uh, and where you invest your effort. And the, what you're describing there essentially is a federated, a hybrid model where you have people embedded in the line of business so that they understand the data and the context that's important to the uh, people posing the questions. And maybe an idea of a centralized team that is, um, is good at the high-end stuff 
Raghu, do you think that there's this kind of uh, sp space for this split role with self-service in many parts of the business, but still a group of specialists to, ask the, to answer the really difficult stuff that self-service couldn't deal with? I tend more to Tom's way of thinking. You're going to have specialists, but they're going to be sprinkled in with domain experts. Uh, it's not going to be this isolated group in a company that people come to because no one ever comes to a centralized group. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at what's involved in interpreting data, there's a spectrum. One part of it is the statistical end which we have talked about, and this actually I'm pretty concerned about. If a machine learning model tells you something, if you don't look at the statistical basis for that decision, how do you know if there's bias? If you're a bank using a learning model to make loan decisions, how do you know whether there's inherent bias somewhere in that decision making based on the data you fed the algorithm and the way the algorithm worked? There'll come a point when we have to take these questions much more seriously. Uh, algorithms, for example, don't come with an index of bias. The other side of the spectrum, we talked about GDPR earlier. Well, Microsoft just went through the rigors, I was going to use a stronger term there, <laughs> of uh, made in GDPR. The stakes here are enormous, okay? If you don't made it, you pay some percentage of your global income. For Microsoft, there would have been on the order of $4 billion a year. But if you look at what's involved, let me give you an example. You know. If Pete were to come and say, Microsoft, what do you know about me? I have to show you a dashboard. Your searches, your browsing, your Skype calls, on and on. And if you were to say, forget my searches, guess what, within a couple of weeks, that's supposed to be purged from every last record. And that isn't so easy when you have immutable HDFS files that have everyone's data interleaved there. Let's that's, say you that's assuming they're online, they could take backups. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And let's say you take care of that. Well, maybe I'm showing you ads based on a profile that I constructed, and I'm showing you ads for Nikon because you searched for camera. Uh, whoops, unless I know you're interested in cameras independently, I'm required to rebuild that particular ad profile. But for that, I need to know how I got at it. And maybe I used 10 different tools over 20 different data sets, ranging from your Twitter feeds to your search history to God knows what. But I have to track lineage through this combination of tools. These are going to be highly specialized in terms of organizational structure. This is where the IT part uh, has to make sure there is a high uniform level of data access, security, lineage tracking, and so on, which is what frees up the next layer of users in the self-serve pie. Right? So that's the kind of specialization you can expect. But when it comes to statistical interpretation of the data, I tend to agree with you, Tom. Yep. It's going to be much more intermixed. And, and that's a, a heavy responsibility that weighs on any organization so that it's done that key enabling work and then can present to its users, or indeed its customers, the ability to self-serve off its data. You mentioned earlier about um, uh, the algorithmic approach and uh, neural networks arriving at delivering outcomes. So the so whole software 2.0 approach, instead of humans doing the coding, it's a computer doing coding and learning better, and the scope for unintentional bias to creep in there. How do you think we can legislate, again, long phrase legislate, how do you think we can protect uh, the services that are offered from having baked in unintentional bias? This is a tough one. Right now I think the state of the art is where we need to be aware of the issue. I'm not sure we necessarily have a technical handle on how to put guardrails in place. Okay, Frankly, whether it is a standalone algorithm or one that's sort of synthesized based on examples. I mean, software 2.0 is a moniker for essentially programming by example, right? This has a long history in the world of queries, but that's much more constrained. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about essentially synthesizing programs 
that are some combinations of matrix multiplies and thresholding, right? How many of us understand the basic operations, let alone the compositions, uh, let alone the tendency to bias that might or might not be induced by a particular composition. Uh, the reality though is in many scenarios, there's an efficient way of generating an outcome. We're going to use it, it's a tool. But the next step is to think through the implications and think through how we can safeguard against some of the negative implications. I think, I think you're right. I think uh, if you look at what's happened in the market, in the uh, uh, open source community, everybody's been focused on how quickly can we develop that algorithm, how quickly can we get that to deployment. And now you're starting to see people look at, okay, how do we measure the efficacy of that uh, model, the efficiency of that model, and uh, just the monitoring of that model. So you're starting to see a lot of investments going in that area in the open source community, and it's, uh, but that usually takes you know, nine to 12 months to say something realistic and pragmatic out of it so moving forward. I think the other thing is, you go back to saying earlier about embedding resources around. If you take domain experts away from the data, they're the people who understand the data, they're the people who spot the biases. So just giving a business analyst a self-serve dashboard, they can click through and just say, oh great, thank you very much, we'll, just, we'll deny all these loans to these people. But actually, the domain expert would then say, well, actually there's, there's a bias here, all those people live in Chelsea and therefore we're denying loans to wealthy people because of whatever this you know, bias of the product is. Um, so we have, you cannot take the business and the technology apart, so you have to have that collaboration. Otherwise, you won't spot them and it'll be too late. You'll be far too down this path that to undo that, it'll be very expensive for the business. I think you're actually making a great point, which is, especially in these times when we don't yet know how to algorithmically identify things like bias. Mm. Self-serve and bringing in the domain experts may be that much more important. It's more about collaborative AI as opposed to standalone AI. And the, the AI there is to help facilitate the human as opposed to, at the moment, basically replace no, the human. No, I like that, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's interesting because at some point the human's going to be posing a question and at some point the human's going to be trying to get answers that deliver insight to them for the questions they want. What's inefficient is if you've already posed that question somewhere in the business and you've already been given an answer, particularly if the answer isn't necessarily time critical. And that, of course, talks to knowledge management. And we've had a question come through from one of the viewers uh, of this webinar about knowledge management. Do you think, as well as the governance around data, there's a particular approach to knowledge management in a self-service environment? I agree. I mean, I think there are, there are some open source software um, platforms around now where people have the ability to tag data sets themselves and start to add more information to enrich, you know, the name field is the field that holds the name. You know, that's, quality bit of help there, but actually, <laughs> as a user, I can start to add more, da more metadata to that in a centralized way. So if, if Tom comes along and says, I need to go and find um, someone's favorite ice cream, rather than just going, oh, it, it'll be the ice cream field, actually it could be the gelato field, and, and metadata will help with that search. And so the business community is adding additional data on top of what the product vendor necessarily thinks is there. Um, and I think you know, there's a number of platforms around that are starting to do this, and I think it's become increasingly mainstream. Yeah. It's yep. about the, 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 the quality and utility of your data is improved in its usage. Yes. Yep. So you have a, a role of the data steward for a specific data set, then you have the, another role of a data validator uh, that comes in that might be tangential to that, org uh, that business unit or uh, a peer uh, that's responsible for that, but then being able to surface that data and do it in a way that uh, is both timely but also current, uh, because it doesn't change, it does evolve quite quickly, so that's where I think it could get stale fairly quickly, uh, and how you solve for that is a different problem altogether. So, there, we've spoken about a lot of different people with a lot of different roles and uh, a bunch of enabling technologies and platforms. There's clearly costs associated with this, and I guess opportunities too. How do we govern the costs and exploit the opportunities, the financial opportunities, of going to a self-service model? Uh, is this a net positive for the organization financially? or is it simply a cost center that has to be endured in order to get to those insights faster? Yeah, so self-service, the way we see it is you have a centralized data engineering team that delivers uh, a platform, uh, and then you have typically, uh, by organization boundary, groups within there that are then consuming resources. Uh, so what we're trying to do, uh, because we're collecting the metadata about the queries that are executed and the clusters that are running, 
uh, create budgets uh, for those organizations to at least understand uh, and that usage because it can get unwieldy and uh, grow fairly quickly. Because as soon as you enable, people get addicted to it, and as soon as they get addicted to it in a cloud model, the, the usage starts to grow, consumption grows, and the cost grows with it. So you have to be careful on what that uh, line is, and being able to provide that visibility back to uh, the data engineering team, uh, as well as the finance team that's supporting that, uh, I think is step one. But it's an area that I think is just getting addressed as the consumption starts to grow, now you have to bring that feedback mechanism back to those users to make sure that they understand there's uh, constraints uh, uh, in, in terms of budgets for those workloads. There's just one thing I'll add to that. The cost of self-serve is simply one piece of the overall cost. Ultimately, everything from capturing the data to cleansing it, to securing it, to establishing lineage, to establishing the various compliance protocols, uh, all of this has a cost. And if you care enough about your data to do all of that, then the self-serve part is a way of amplifying the use of that data, right? And you know what you said, Tom. That's exactly right. Uh, data engineering, if you think about those workloads, that's not going to really necessarily drive the business. It's the algorithms, it's the insight, it's all the business users that then uh, empowered to get yield out of that data, but the cost center itself of the curation of that data can get pretty expensive very quickly, but you have to be able to invest in it, uh, which lends itself to an earlier comment about starting small and proving success. So the act of going to self-serve is all about being an amplifier on the return of investment of the underlying and enabling stuff that's got to be done. How do you articulate that value proposition? One more thing, well, the point right. that you made earlier, Pete, that this can be a collaborative effort in maintaining the quality and you know, the meaning of the data, that's important as well. It's mm. not just amplification, it's also ensuring that what's there makes sense. I think, it, just to go on to your question, I think it goes back to business engagement because if you, if you take an advertising model, you know, selling cameras or selling adverts on a, on a website, you know, it could be that we've come up with a new algorithm. It's taken us a year to develop the algorithm. It's cost us a million pounds to develop that. Mm -hmm how do we know the return on investment? And you, you can't just have a separate department sitting there saying, oh, here is a new advertising algorithm. I feel very clever, well done, thank you very much, I can go off to the pub now. <laughs> you have to have the business engaged, the business then knows that here is what was, we would have had before, here's what we could have had afterwards. So, you know, almost running models in parallel so you can see how behavior would have happened. Yeah. Taking the business on a journey through this, you know, no one just blindly deploys code anymore. You have to have a business justification for it. There's, it's not just about expense, it's risk exposure, it's, you know, what's my bug risk with this? You know, the models might not, might have bias in them. So, in taking the business through that journey of design, develop, test, and release, that will then give you data on what's my ROI. You know, that data then can be mined its own way. You have another self-serve team for that data. You know, so it is about feedback loops. It's about allowing people to know that um, it's not just a blind cost center. It is something yeah. that's adding value. I mean, an email server is a cost center, but we can't live without email these days. No. But to your point earlier about collaboration, uh, I think there's an argument that says you could never ascribe the success of a certain bit on the company's bottom line just to that data endeavor, whether that data is uh, in a self-service posture or a centralized posture or something in between. Mm -hmm. I think it's a collaborative approach. So there's something that talks about um, the way to explain the value of what you're doing is that you wouldn't have been able to produce that benefit at all or as fast or as effectively without that data endeavor, but nor does the data endeavor on, in and of itself just produce that, so there's a collaboration. That requires a certain amount of trust, I think, between uh, lines of business and enabling data areas. Uh, do you see uh, transparency and trust as being something that improves with self-service? I think the way the world is going these days with the internet and with data, trust, it's happening more and more. It's, you, you can't operate a business where you have closed doors and people having meetings where oh, I've made a decision based on a whim, because the moment those people try to explain that whim to the rest of the business, you'll get the rest of the business coming, well, I've got data, this proves your, your yeah. argument, et cetera. And I, I think we're seeing that more in businesses now, where the data-driven business, the data-driven organization, it just doesn't survive 
in this connected data enabled environment. So I think, and, and trust is implicit with that. So if I trust my data, which goes back to the points we made earlier, as long as that trust carries through and I have the lineage and I have the governance processes there, then yes, I think, I think trust does come from that. Yeah, I think you, at some point, it's a, it is a collaborative effort. You can't sit there and say, look, my one algorithm led to this specific uh, OKR uh, and us for accomplishing that OKR. I think it happens across the board. It's some organic growth, some new growth as a part of a potential recommendation engine. So there absolutely has to be a lot of collaboration. Taking credit for all of it, um, you kind of get in yourself a, a, a bit of a circle there where you'll never get yourself out of it. <laughs> so, yeah. The danger of being indispensable. Yes. This, this whole thing, it boils down to what you trust or don't trust. One of the things that's happening, I think, is it's shifting from do I trust you to do I trust your data, show me. Okay, how does it compose with my data? Does it make sense, right? And if you take this highly data-driven lens, overall I think it's great goodness. But the couple of caveats again, I hate to come across as the guy sounding the caution all the time, but especially because I'm so gung-ho about the potential for living through your data lens, I also worry a little bit about it, right? So the things you measure, being focused on looking at the data to determine your next step, then measuring, for example, the outcome of your ad campaign to determine if it worked or not in terms of the numbers you set out to measure. That's wonderful. But by the same token, you're not optimizing in all likelihood unless you're really mature for the things you don't explicitly measure. So there are errors of omission and commission that could have unintended consequences. Let alone fancy stuff like, oh, that algorithm has some bias. Very simple things like, are you measuring everything you need to? Are you sufficiently aware, at least qualitatively, of things you don't measure? I'm going to give you an example. At Yahoo, we showed algorithm, uh, algorithmically, we decided what to show people when they came to the website. And we tried bazillion algorithms and bucket tests concurrently. We had millions of users coming. So when I show you an article, if you click on it, that's good. If you don't, you don't. The ratio is the click-through ratio. This is the holy grail. You want to improve it. But someone once told me, Raghu, if all you want to do is improve the CTR, just show lots of scantily clad women, <laughs> okay? Uh, but then that changes the voice of the publication. Voice is not something you explicitly measure, no. okay? But you know the difference between the New York Times and the New York Post? That's voice, okay? Long-term health of the site, which is not the immediate click-through, but do the same people come back once they form a certain mental impression of what they'll find on your site? Maybe you improve your click-through this week, but what about this year? These are the unintended consequences, right? So people who understand the bigger ethos, uh, they use measurements and data effectively. People who don't, they can be very data-driven, but they are borrowing a deep hole. I really liked your earlier point about the fundamental change of relationships from do I trust you to do I trust your data. <clears throat> and maybe we could extrapolate that further and it's, I don't need to worry about whether I trust you now, I need to know whether I trust your data, but I also need to know, do I trust the insights you are interpreting from that data yes. and the decisions you're making as a result? Yes. And that's perhaps where the debate goes to around the board table in an organization. Yes. I'll leave that one hanging there. I'd like to finish on my last question. It's going to be the same question to all three of you. So as the first two are listening to the first, the next two are listening to the first answer, here we go. The question's going to be, if we are serious about uh, the scope for data and analytics to help businesses, typically we're moving from an historic uh, approach to a, an advanced approach of predictive and prescriptive, where we're looking forward in time and helping organizations become more proactive and more anticipatory. So let's try and apply that approach of prediction to your predictions, please. My question is, Looking out over the next year, 18 months, two years, what are your predictions for 
the self-service approach to data and analytics. And I can tell that Tom is gagging to go first. I went first <laughs> last time, <laughs> Tim. Let's start with you, Tom, and work our way back. Okay. Uh, Give me your one key prediction. I think that, uh, selfishly speaking, uh, the, the maturity around structured streaming, streaming analytics, uh, being able to ingest that data uh, at a very high velocity uh, with a lot of volume is going to, and then having that data land and ready to be consumed uh, quickly is going to drive a lot uh, for organizations. Being able to provide that uh, near real time uh, analysis, data science use cases, uh, algorithm development, and then also measuring those algorithms and monitoring the efficacy of those are areas that you're going to see the most investment in uh, within organizations. So it's really focused on the ingest uh, and the quality, and that I think that will allow you to uh, really improve the quality of the data that's landing in that data lake, and then being able to then, on the back end, measure the uh, efficiency or the efficacy of those algorithms are where you're going to see a lot of the investment, a lot of the improvements. Great, uh, and I think we can all, that all chimes with all of us about those very real challenges to be able to deliver that. Pete, your prediction. I think I'm going to further on my comments about collaborative AI, and I think that you know, we've, we've talked about how AI helps, but it is a black box fundamentally in most cases. And so in order for businesses to adopt it further, I think they need to be able to trust it. And trust at the moment involves a human maybe looking at what workflow did this AI actually come up with to resolve from that, that data point. So I think we're probably going to see more around, you know, how, how is, how is AI actually working rather than just, oh, it's a clever little elf box that I throw data into. Um, I want to know how it resolves that position. And I think you know, we're seeing some technologies coming out in that place at the moment, but I think there'll be, there'll be further work in that. Thank you. And Raghu? You know, as Yogi Berra said, prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to see some of the artificial boundaries between traditional kinds of data infrastructure, enterprise warehouses, and some of the more loose structured self-serve approaches, the lakes and the like, come together. I think you're going to see much more emphasis on responsible use of data, on governance, on discovery of relevant data. Uh, my hope is, that as we democratize data and more and more people come to use it to feel at first hand the power it has for good or bad, we'll also think more about privacy, we'll also think more about responsible use overall. Is that a prediction? I don't know, but I certainly hope it is. Well, on that positive note about the ethics of exploiting data, and that's a completely different conversation, I'll close it there. Tom, Pete, and Raghu, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today uh, at Bright Talks. And so that's it from us for Bright Talks for this session. Thank you very much for joining us at Big Data London, and we'll see you again next time.